going. And basically what I'm showing you, and this is not a controversial, this is well recognized in science today. I teach this, I teach at a medical school as well as uh, at a college where most of my students are nurses, and it's absolutely clear that mutations result in degradation of the genome. Absolutely clear. Okay? And also, I've pointed out research proves evolution is true, but it's going the wrong way. Oops. <laughs> A little problem there, yes. And uh, let me define evolution. The best definition, it's short and pithy, and of course that's what people remember, but the best definition was given by Jonathan this morning, or last, yesterday, I guess, and that is from the goo to you by way of the zoo. Okay, we start out with goo, with a bunch of organic compounds. The organic compounds somehow got together, and we ended up with cells, Cells eventually ended up with um, single-celled animals, amoeba, and then we ended up with fish, and then reptiles, and then amphibians, and then uh, mammals, and then primates, and here we are. So that's a good definition. Okay, everyone repeat. From the goo to you by way of the zoo. Okay, so if someone asks you what evolution is, that is the standard definition. Okay. What we're showing you, it's abbreviated, but that's the definition. I mean, you could say from hydrogen to people, and there are a lot of other definitions, but that's pretty clear. So evolution is true, but it's going the wrong way. Darwin was right in his 1871 book when he titled it The Descent of Man. <laughs> he meant the ascent of man. Ascent is going upward. The descent of man, we're going downward. Okay? We are descending, and that's what the research shows, and I'll show you briefly. I'll give you kind of an abbreviated uh, presentation here. The problem is not survival of the fittest, of course, but arrival of the fittest. That has always been the problem. That's the problem Darwin had, and that's the problem everyone since had. Where does the arrival of the fittest come from? Where do they come from? Where do we get cells? There can't be any evolution until you have life. How do we get life? How do we get cells? How do we get the arrival of the fittest? It's a problem they have never solved, and it's pretty clear to me they never will solve it. Okay? So when someone says, given my definition here of evolution, I am an evolutionist. Evolution is true, but it's going the wrong way. And of course, keep in mind the definition I gave you because a lot of people, when they talk about evolution, they talk about breeding dogs. I know, we had a wolf, and now we've got 300 breeds of dogs, and we're getting more every year. There's many, many examples of that. That's not what we're talking about. We're not concerned about where collies came from. I mean, we know where collies came from. We're concerned about where dogs came from, where people came from, where birds came from. That's the focus. And that's the focus we'll look at in this uh, presentation. Okay, the primary basis of macroevolution is mutations. This is the theory now. Mutations produce the variety that natural selection can select. So the theory is based on two different things. Mutation produces variety. Natural selection selects that variety. That's evolution. That's evolution, very simply. And Ernst Mayer, a well-known biologist, just died. He was 99 when he died. He was a professor at Harvard. He said, ultimately, all variation is due to mutation. So it's the foundation. Theodosius Dobzhansky, who also died a few years ago, he's a Russian scientist, he said mutation is the only source of the raw materials and hence of evolution. Very clear. So if you show that mutation cannot produce the variety we're looking for, evolution is dead in the water, unequivocally. Now there are other sources of variation, sexual reproduction, crossing over, if you study genetics you'll understand that, transposition and so on, but these don't produce new information, they just shift, shuffle around, shift around the existing information. Nothing new. It's like uh, when my wife redecorates the house, she just moves the furniture around. <laughs> okay? It looks different, it looks new, but there's nothing new in the house. It's just a different arrangement. And Richard Dawkins, we'll look at what he had to say since he is now the leading evolutionary scientist in the world. He was just voted the most intelligent man in the whole world. <laughs> and so uh, we'll have to 
rely upon what he has to say, and I uh, cut and pasted this right from his website. Okay, the goal is he's British, so me thinks it's like a weasel, that's from Shakespeare. So he has a computer program, and you type in letters randomly, and then the program changes the letters, and if it saves something, okay, these are the letters, start out with W, and the program did not save that because it doesn't meet the goal of me thinks it's like a weasel. M does, so that's saved. So now we get M saved, and of course D, that doesn't meet the goal, so E does. So eventually, in Act 44, repetitions, we get me thinks it's like a weasel. That's how evolution works. Okay? That's his, that's his uh, way. The problem is, this is a program written by a very intelligent guy. Okay? And number two is, you're not going to have life with a bunch of gobbledygook. You've got to start out with something that at least works before it works which makes sense. It's got to work before evolution works. So the problems with this idea of mutations as a source of variation is, number one, we assume mutations are random, and in fact, we know they're not. Okay, but let's assume for a minute they are random. Okay, if they were random, this is what we would get. And you can see here the different ways of getting serine, and of course, these are the four base pairs, A, G, T, and C. The four base pairs, or three base pairs, four base pairs, we get codes of three, sets of three. So if we look at then the results, we're going to get serine six different ways, which is about 9.4% of all the combinations, okay, of all the possible combinations. So randomly, we'll get lots of serine, lots of arginine, lots of leucine, lots of valine. We'll get hardly any, well, 1.6% methionine, 1.6% tryptophan. So what's going to happen? Mutations are going to move toward this direction and away from this direction. So what is going to happen is the genome will degenerate. And this is the work I did at the medical school. I did worked on mutations. That was my job. And we study mutations all day and all night. That's what we looked at. So we know a lot of this stuff. We know that mutations cause degeneration of the ge genome. And then another problem is Mutation from one base to another is not equal. So one study found, for example, that conversion to thymine was 58% of the total conversions. So mutations occurred. We got a G to a T, and that occurred 16% of the time. A C to a, a T, 42%, and an A to a T, 0.7%. So that was the conversions. So what's going to happen? We're going to end up with a lot of thymines, not very many guanines, and not very many cytosines and hardly any adenosines. So what's going to happen is, is that we're going to degenerate toward thymines. In fact, conversion to thymine is 10 times more common than conversion to adenine. So using Dawkins' model, what do we get? We get, well, we start out with some gobbledygook, just randomly type in the computer, and we're going to end up with all thymines eventually. So that's degeneration. That's not uh, going to improve anything. And then hot spots, a very important concept. There are hot spots and cold spots. Hot spots are where mutations are more common. Cold spots are where they're less common. And when we look at an example of the CG dinucleotide, it's involved in mutations about 12 times more often than other dinucleotide sequences. And that's only one example. And here, look at E. coli gene, and this is the number of changes, mutations, in the gene, and this is the first uh, code, the second, the third, the fourth, and so on. You can see there's a lot of them where one mutation occurred. There is two here that's more than one occurred. These, no mutations occurred. And here you can see the position 199. We ended up with lots of mutations. And when we look at not just the E. coli genome, but other genomes, what we see is that mutations are far more common in certain areas, and they're called hot spots. And that's very important in doing research in cancer. It's a critical thing we have to look at, understanding the source of mutations for cancer. And that's important because there are many different kinds of cancer depending upon the mutation, where it is. So more and more we're treating cancer not according to whether there's a mutant, but where the mutant is in the genome or in the gene, in this case, we're concerned about, and that allows us to fine-tune our treatment of cancer. 
So it's very important. So we know there's a lot of hot spots. They're all over the place. And one study found two mutations accounted for 94.4% of all mutations out of the 319 that this study identified. So primary, uh, primarily what's going to happen is here's a hot spot, and the hot spots will keep changing, and we'll never get me thinks it's like a weasel. And that's important, too. That's, this is an interesting thing, which has nothing to do with the presentation, but hot spots are important because every now and then we get a mutation, Okay, then the mutation goes back to the original, called a back mutation, and no longer is the mutation found in that genetic line. So spontaneous healing, you might call it. And that uh, occurs because of hot spots. So if we combine these together, what do we get? We'll end up with hot spots, lots of T's, and these are cold spots, not many changes. So given Dawkins' example, what's going to happen? The de genome is going to degenerate. And that's exactly what happens. Okay, polarity, and I'll go through that quickly. Polarity is important. In order for the folding to occur correctly, correctly there are four different kinds of bonds which hold the protein uh, t together, the amino acid chain to fold together to produce the functional protein. And we need some of these polar negative and polar positive, but you can see there's not very many ways of getting that. And that's a problem for evolution. OK, now are beneficial mutations common? I did a literature research on beneficial mutations. And I found in biological abstracts about 170. This is kind of outdated, so there are more now. Medline, 283, total of about a half a million. Beneficial mutations, 98, 88, total of 186. Some overlap here, so it's not quite 186. But beneficial mutations are not even talked about much in the literature. Because they're pretty rare. Now, let's look at some of these beneficial mutations. Well, 0.04% is what articles that talked about beneficial mutations. Some of these several articles talked about the same mutation. So there's not you know, 200 beneficial mutations. There is 200 articles that talked about beneficial mutations. And here's one good example is, is this is beneficial for people, but not for, the, in this case, the plant. Seedless fruit. It's a loss mutation. Okay? It's helpful for us because, well, watermelon, I don't know, what do you do? What, I, when I eat watermelon, I just swallow the seeds. It's you know, gross to spit them out in your hand, so what do you do? Well, so watermelon and other fruits now, we have seedless fruits, but this is a loss. So that's a good point. Yeah, there are a lot of problems. In fact, when I point this out to students, they can very readily point out a lot of problems with his analogy. But it's interesting that this is the best analogy he's been able to come up with, which really does a better job showing the flaws of the whole evolutionary idea. OK, we got seedless fruit. Another example, this is kind of neat, because when I presented this, I was in Sweden where this was discovered. So I didn't know that until I was there. They said, oh, we, we discovered that here. At the university I was speaking, at, actually, is where they discovered it. And uh, this is the Belgian blue cattle. And the advantage is. 20 to 30% more muscle. The meat was tender and low in fat. Talk about ideal. It's great. Okay, the Belgian blue cattle. And it's not around today much anymore. Well, there it is. It's the Arnold Schwarzenegger of the <laughs> cattle world. And uh, that's what it looks like. Now, this is seen as a beneficial mutation, and it is in a, in a sense, but. What causes it? Well, there are side effects, including reduction of fertility, and there are health side effects, and the result of this, or the mutation, is actually information loss. In fact, specifically, they lost a 11 base pair deletion in a coding region in the breaks. Systems have breaks so that the muscle develops so far and then they stop, stops developing, or bones develop so far and they stop developing. The brakes are broken. And so the development goes beyond what it's supposed to. Okay? And that's what causes the, the change. So is it a beneficial mutation? Well, they thought it was at first, but now they have second thoughts. Another example is this one Darwin used in 1791. Seth Wright noted a male lamb in his flock that had short, bent legs resembled a dash hound. And uh, advantage? Well, it couldn't jump. 
fences, saving the sheep herd a lot of money. And I just came across the reference the other day. This is still talked about as a new species. So Darwin and the others were excited, and this has been in textbooks for years, that here we got a new species, one generation, caused by a mutation. So there's proof of evolution. For many scores of years, this has been in the textbooks as proof of evolution. Well, let's look at this more carefully. There is pictures, actually, from a textbook. And you can see there's the Ancon sheep. And it's easier to keep track of them because you don't need very high fences. Okay, and there's another example. I found this in hundreds of college and high school textbooks. There's another example. And uh, this is a lethal, we found out now, it's a lethal deformity called a chondroplasia. It's not a new breed, it's a disease. And they tried to save it because it obviously has advantages for the sheep herder, but they failed. And there's a chondroplasia in humans. Same thing. Short legs, very short legs. And uh, another example is six-finger mutation. I got this when I did a presentation in uh, Canada. And the professor there said, now wait a minute. Here is a beneficial mutation. This guy has six fingers on each hand. This allows him to, and there you can see his hand, looks pretty normal. This is the abnormal finger right here. And there you can see even the bones, looks pretty good. And this man is better able to climb trees as a result of this distortion. But ironically, it usually doesn't turn out so well. This is more typical of this type of mutation. And this mutation is actually widely known. It's very common among the Amish community. And typically, when a child is born with a six finger, they lop it off. They remove it. And this is caused by what they call a stuttering error. So when the fingers are produced, instead of producing five, it stutters. Again, you have a stop section which doesn't work, and as a result, you end up with an extra finger. Is that a beneficial mutation? Well, I guess if you climb trees, it is. But on the other hand, these people have a hard time doing other things like writing or many other tasks. And here we got, boy, this child has an extra arm, third arm. Now, that would be really useful. I'll tell you, to have three arms would be, you know, you could hold your baby with one and cook dinner with the other. Enormously useful. But in this case, neither arm was functional, and they had to lop both of them off, which is tragic. And there are a lot of these examples, actually. Here's a sheep, which has got one, two, three, four five, six, seven, I think, seven legs. And this is beneficial to the farmer because he charges people money to come in and look at his sheep. <laughs> so he's doing okay, but not beneficial for the sheep. Obviously, in the, in the wild, well, he can't walk. So in the wild, he would not last long at all because uh, he can't get around. And here, this child is born with a huge brain, and we might assume he's got it. I, uh, IQ twice Einstein's, but in fact, he ended up, the child ended up dying. The brain just, again, we have a stop code on which wasn't working, a stop system which wasn't working, and as a result, the child died. And then these are more common examples of mutations. And we've studied mutations for a long time, and I'm not aware of a single mutation which is clearly beneficial except this one. And this is only beneficial for the bacteria. It's the ribosome, which is what coordinates the uh, production of protein. And this is a regulatory system here. And the regulatory system helps regulate the amount of protein produced. And streptomycin fits right in the regulatory system. And streptomycin happens to turn it off. So the bacteria dies. That's how streptomycin works. Fits right in there, and the bacteria dies. Okay. A mutation here changes the receptor site so it no longer accepts the streptomycin, so this bacteria is resistant against streptomycin. It's a resistant strain. They call it a super bacteria. The problem is, though, it is damaged in a normal environment. This guy cannot compete with normal bacteria. So now in a medical situation, what is often done is, is they'll send the patient home, 
the patient will be exposed to normal bacteria. The normal bacteria will wipe out the so-called super bacteria, and the patient's okay. It's one reason they send patients home early. One of the worst places to be when you're sick is in a hospital, because you've got all kinds of resistant strains of bacteria in a hospital. And it is a mutation, it is damage, but you can see it's not beneficial. We have in, in, in the long run for the bacteria. It's beneficial only in an environment which has a high level of antibiotics. That's all. And they call that a fitness cost. So there's an advantage in one situation, but in a normal situation outside of the hospital, there is not an advantage. Uh, and there's another example we'll skip. This is probably my favorite example. This is the HIV virus. The HIV virus, to get into the cell, you may not know this, but viruses have to have the key to get into the cell, like I have to have a key to get into my house. Okay? And the key in this case, actually, there are two locks. It's got to have a key for both of them. And so when this one, the CCR5 receptor, is damaged, and you can see here it's damaged, it's damaged because the gene is premature uh, truncation, and as a result, the whole thing is not produced. As a result, it's not inserted into the cell membrane. As a result, the HIV cannot bind, and this guy, therefore, is resistant to HIV. And there are a number of cases of these. The one I remember is some guy, he lived with his lover, and his lover got HIV and died, and he was checked out, and they said, oh, you're fine. And his second lover got HIV and died, and they checked him out, and he said he was, he said he was fine. And he said, wait a minute. First two lovers are dead. I'm okay. What's going on here? Either somebody up there really likes me <laughs> or there's something else going on. And then they researched and they found out, indeed, this is a mutation which causes him to have HIV resistance. But on the other hand, the damage here results in a higher rate of certain kinds of cancers. So it's not a benefit in the long run. It's a benefit if you're exposed to HIV, but it's not a benefit if you end up with, of course, a cancer. So all of these mutations that I've looked at, there are some that are really beneficial, but they're not evolving, they're not improving, something is damaged. So the end result is we now know that 99.99% of all mutations are either harmful or what they call near neutral. Near neutral means that by themselves they don't cause a problem, but they add up. Okay, it's kind of, I did marriage counseling for a number of years in Toledo, I'm, there's, work for a clinic, Arlington Psychological Associates, and I found that most couples, the divorce was precipitated in most cases by a bunch of minor things that all added up. Does that make sense? It wasn't a big thing. It wasn't one thing and had a great marriage and all of a sudden this happened and that's it. Typically, it's a whole bunch of minor things. Well, the same thing happens with people. And here's the result of the non-functional CCR5. And uh, beneficial mutation frequency, 99.99% are lethal or near neutral. And what happens is, is that the number of near neutral mutations adds up until we have what they call genetic catastrophe or genetic meltdown and the species goes extinct. And that happens over and over, we know. Okay? The best example of that is aging. Why do people age? They age because they accumulate near neutral mutations, none of which are a problem, but when you get lots of them, you end up with system meltdown and you die. And that's what causes death for most cases. If a truck hits you, of course, it's not the, not the cause. But my aunt died, who as far as I knew, never was in a hospital in her whole life. And when she died, she got a, had a bad headache. She went to the hospital, and during the night she died. So I asked the doctor, why did she die? What, what, what was the reason? He said, well, there was no reason. I said, well, come on, she's dead. There's a reason. He says, well, there were lots of reasons. She was close to 90. Her kidneys were weak. Her stomach was weak. Her lungs were weak. Her brain was beginning to accumulate mutations. The best description, he said, of what she died of is everything. Nothing specific, just there was a massive failure because all her systems were weak. And then what do you put on the death certificate? You typically put down heart failure. 
Well, the heart failure isn't what caused her to die. It's just that when she died, her heart failed, so that's what they put down. <laughs> heart failure. And that's commonly done. So often they didn't die of you know, heart failure. They died of something else, and the heart eventually failed. And that's what happened. Sometimes they just say she died of old age, which is, I guess, the best way to, to go if you have to uh, leave this uh, earth uh, for now. It's just old age. So you're not dying of anything specific, just you get old. And species likewise get old. And when they get old, what happens? They have failure. And we cover this quite effectively in our uh, schools. OK. How many mutations does Darwinism require? A lot of estimates. Nobody knows, but a lot. Uh, Shermer estimates trillions. And he's an uh, evolutionist, by the way. And de-evolution. We talked about this, the near neutral accumulate, causing the species to age. So the organs are less effective. Sight, smell is less effective. Hearing, skin. Uh, best example I can think of is when I go to a restaurant, the older clientele will take the salt shaker and turn it over and shake and shake and shake. And I often think, just take the lid off and pour it all on. <laughs> well, why do they do that? They do that because, of course, they don't taste food much anymore. My mother-in-law now is facing this. She just doesn't like hardly anything. She eats because she has to, not because she enjoys it. She's 95. And as a result, well, they use a lot of salt because the sense of taste and hearing and sight and everything is going. So if they go with our bodies, they also, same thing happens with our, our genome. OK, uh, founding mutations. We know that because if we go back in history, we find, for example, sickle cell anemia. Nobody had sickle cell anemia a long time ago, as far as we know. In fact, they have identified the area where the first sickle cell anemia came from, entered in the gene pool. And everybody since then who has sickle cell anemia is related to that one person. And that's called a founding mutation. And there are a lot of examples of these. Now, a lot of them, it's hard to trace them back that far, but Sickle cell anemia, Tay-Sachs disease, hemochromatosis. There are a lot of diseases which we have been able to trace back that far. So we know that a long time ago, well, this is what the Bible teaches. Adam and Eve were perfect. They had no mutations. And since then, mutations have been entering the genome until there are more and more mutations. And so what do we see? De-evolution. It's going backward. And uh, again, I'll skip a lot of this. One other problem is, this is a diagram of the biochemical interrelationships. It's like a circuit board. And the problem is, well, this computer, which I think somebody already did this to it, but if you go in there and snip a wire, I bet the whole thing will fail. Any wire. Well, here we see when something is damaged, a gene is, damages, is damaged, and therefore a protein is uh, uh, malformed. Often the whole system or a large part of it fails because it's so highly interconnected. And since that's a bunch of gobbledygook, I got a better picture so you can see how it's connected. Defructose and D-mannose, and, and uh, these are the biochemical relationships. Uh, but better is what they call the interactome. And there's the interactome. This protein here affects all of these proteins and with all the lines you can see how many of this affects. Now, some of these don't look like they affect any other proteins. The reason is, is we're still working on this. <laughs> so once we get this worked on, then we find that the interactome among proteins is enormous. And this is why every medicine has a side effect, which means that when we take a medicine, it affects this, which is what we want it to affect, but it also affects all of these things. So the Interactome tells us that the whole thing is interrelated. The whole protein system is interrelated. So what happens if we have a mutation here? Let's say it causes a beneficial change here. So I have a mutation here, a beneficial change here. Ha-ha, we've got a beneficial mutation. But what's going to happen all over here? Probably negative effects. So it's very hard, even if you get a beneficial mutation, to have an overall beneficial result because this thing is so interconnected, well, just like taking drugs. You get a prescription drug, aspirin, for example. Aspirin is great to cure headaches, but
but it also messes up the stomach's ability to protect itself. Okay? And that's true with all drugs. There's not one drug that doesn't have side effects that's a problem. The problem is, can you deal with a side effect? Is it really bad or is it just, you know, can you uh, get around it? And Sigmund will skip that. This again shows you the enormous interrelationship. And here you can see these are receptors. Something binds here, a hormone, for example, binds here. And you can see then all the proteins that it has to go through before it gets to the nucleus, which is what most uh, receptors affect. So if you have a mutation here, what's going to happen? Whole thing fails. Best example is, uh, it's, it's on here. Uh, well, BRCA1 is a good example. And there's another one, uh, RAF, RAF. When, when RAF is damaged, the whole system is damaged. That's important because that's the uh, leading cause of many cancers. And the classical view of genes where it starts here, we've got to start codon, that's the gene, we've got to stop codon, all done. Now we know genes overlap, you've got some here, you've got some here, and you have some inside of other genes. So now if you damage this gene or change it, you may get a beneficial mutation from that, something may be positive, but you're going to end up affecting many other genes. So even at this level, we find interactions important. And we also now know that 94% of human genes generate more than one product. And I'll show you what that means. And that's a result, by the way, of alternative splicing. And the best example is this CAM, this gene, you have 95 alternative splicing, spliced exons. So you end up with 38 possible isoforms, which means 38,000 possible different proteins. So from one gene, you can get 38,000 different proteins. And as far as we know, this is true with all genes. So what happens if we have a mutation here in this gene? Well, you could affect many, many hundreds or thousands of other proteins. So it's all connected. And complexity problem, I'll just skip that quickly. You can. Uh, that's a bacterial flagellum, and you can see you've got to have all these parts to work. For this to work, you've got to have every part. If you're missing this, it doesn't work. If you're missing the MS ring, it doesn't work. If you're missing the basal body or even part of it, it doesn't work, etc. And we already talked about this, so we'll just get through this quickly. And, oh, one interesting point is, is how can we survive with all these mutations? They estimate now there are 5,000 diseases caused by mutations. How can we survive? Well, redundancy. So if we get a mutation which, you're, for example, the a kidney fails, well, you've got another one. You've got a backup. And this is true with many structures. You have backups. And for the genes, for example, most genes you have a pair. So if one's damaged, you've got a spare. You have another one. And uh, a lot of redundancy factors. And eventually you get mutational meltdown from mildly deleterious, deleterious mutations. And this fact is widely acknowledged as an important source of extinction for asexual. Lynch concluded it's also an important factor for sexual populations. And uh, good reference due to contamination of the genome by very slightly deleterious mutations. Why have we not died 100 times over? Well, medicine helps that. The example they use in my medical biochemistry textbook is each generation has 100 more mutations than the previous. Your children have 100 to 200, actually, more mutations than you do. Their children have 100 to 200 more. So your grandchildren may have 2 to 3 to 4 to 500 more mutations than you do. So the human genome is accumulating more and more mutations, and as is well recognized, therefore, we are going backward. So evolution is true, but it's going backward. There really is no question that evolution did not occur, it could not occur, and that's the result of science. I, at one time, was an atheist, and doing this research convinced me that evolution is not the explanation to how we got here. It's simply not true. And therefore, once I realized that evolution isn't true, what other choice do you have? We either created by intelligence or we evolved as a result of natural law, natural selection, 
mutations, copying errors, etc. So once I eliminated the one possibility, the only other possibility was we were created. As we, when I was an atheist, as we often said, evolution is the doorway to atheism. In our atheist magazines, we talk more about evolution than practically anything else. Because we realize you sell them evolution, and many of them, or most of them, will select uh, uh, Darwinism or, or, and atheism. 